Um, so welcome to uh, some talk about Slack or Slack Talk, uh, as the title uh, goes, Social Learning Across, Across Content Coalition, uh, which many of you know was announced on uh, Monday of this week um, with uh, many participants across the content provider, publisher, library, uh, and aggregation space. Um, so what we wanted to do in this session today is bring together some of the members uh, from those different uh, perspectives and talk a bit about what's going on uh, with Slack, why we in particular find it so interesting and why we hope that you will as well. Uh, to kick us off, uh, Dan Whaley, uh, man of the week here at the conference, uh, mm -hmm. was gonna talk in a little bit more detail if you have missed it, about what Slack uh, is is and what it's doing. And then we'll go into some questions that I've prepared and hopefully uh, you will have questions as well that we can uh, share with our speakers and, and have a lively uh, conversation for this uh, last Friday of uh, I Annotate. And welcome back, Delmar. We're glad uh, that you found your way back. So um, Dan, I'm gonna hand it over to you and I believe you're gonna show some slides for us. Yeah. So I'll show a few slides. I, I won't make this long. Um, I think this is more useful if it's just a discussion, um, but just give a little bit of a background here. Um, this coalition, social learning coalition, um, which we um, seemed to have named uh, Slack. Um, we tried experimented with a lot of different things, but um, uh, uh, such as it is. Um, so the basic premise here is that um, is, is this is really a kind of user focused and a user centric um, premise uh, in that students and teachers need tools that work um, kind of the same quote unquote, no matter where they are, um, not um, a, a, a different tools that are geared to, to do the same thing, but are implemented differently on every single different content platform that they go to. Um, so in this, in the way that you might build, a, you know, an extension that you can take with you around the web, um, how do you bring a common capability to you kind of as, as you, um, you know, travel to different content platforms, even within the course of a single day as a student or as a teacher. Uh, and so the, 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 the idea was formed to kind of build a coalition of content platforms, publishers, tool providers, and so forth. Um, uh, to work towards uh, uh, this vision where social learning can take place anywhere in the same way, regardless of your, your vendor. And we built, even though some of the applications of this might not necessarily be social learning, um, the, the social learning as a frame felt like a good home and a good kind of um, conceptual going to base it, uh, a foundation to build this on, and that's why we call it a social learning coalition. Um, so more specifically with, with regard, you know, kind of technically in terms of how these, um, um, the, the different content pr pr uh, platforms, LMSs, tool providers work, um, that um, there, is, there is a standard called LTI, um, which is you know, really foundational to the experience of students on, in most uh, major kind of institutions on a daily basis. Um, and tools can inherit um, or can be built into the LMS and can inherit uh, the services and authentication and so forth. It's called the Learning Tools <coughs> Operability Standard. Um, but there's a lot of asterisks in that, and that you know usually only one tool or one content platform can kind of inherit that session at a time. It's more difficult to kind of swap them back and forth, uh, to, to swap that information and that the session and authentication information back and forth. It's very clumsy. Um, LMSs don't implement this in in very sensible ways a lot of the times. Um, content platforms are very uneven in terms of uh, how content is rendered and, and made available. Um, and ultimately, the, this, from, in, from our perspective, in terms of trying to implement this, it's led to um, challenges, a variety of different challenges, which we think a, a kind of a common approach um, can improve on. Um, so the goal uh, was to, to organize a coalition of, of platforms, work to identify mm -hmm. these obstacles, 
um, make proposals about how they could be addressed um, and then work towards implementations um, and work kind of work in the open and share best practices uh, with each other. Um, so that the ask in particular of uh, participants was um, fundamentally that they agree with a vision, um, that they would explore what doing this would, meant, would mean for their own platforms, um, and, um, and, and then prioritize that work over time, uh, collaborate with, with the group in achieving those goals and, and be public about it. Um, so we'll work um, ultimately towards a set of technical rec recommendations for content coalition members across a series of, of different areas um, and demonstrate uh, initial examples of, of the implementation of those and then see if, in particular, if any of those recommendations make sense to be incorporated upstream into some of the existing standards frameworks, in particular LTI. We are in touch with IMS. Um, they are interested in, and I think excited about this. We have some of our first conversations uh, that will happen over the next couple of weeks with with their um, groups. It may make sense to form a in an, L, an L, IMS working group to help implement this, and and if that's one of the primary outcomes of of this coalition, and, and it it helped in a, in a sense pulling those groups together helped to illustrate that, and and that the primary work happen in in authenticated relation related parts of this discussion happens in IMS. That's totally fine with us. Our um, you know from my perspective, our goal is only to kind of see this happen. Um, anybody is welcome to join that, that ultimately wants to enable powerful social educational experiences across content platforms and you know, shares this commitment to user experience and interoperability. If, uh, you're, if that describes you, then please reach out. This email address is a good one for contacting us or, or reach out to any of the members. Um, um, right now, we've got 16 uh, members from kind of a range of different kinds of platforms, um, Barnes & Noble, uh, Daisy, EBSCO, uh, Free eBook, which is also uh, Eric uh, Hellman, who works at the Project Gutenberg, um, institutions like Gao Day, uh, UC Davis, um, also another, uh, and another kind of range of um members, probably an equal number of these that are in final dis discussions of, of, about joining that we think will, will probably um, um, be coming over the next uh, um, in coming weeks and months. Um, there's a website here with um, some videos of people kind of explaining in their own words from these different um, um, projects why the, this makes um, sense and in terms of their own objectives and, and, and goals, um, check it out. Um, and I think that's it. Thanks, Dan. Um, that's fantastic. Um, so uh, I mentioned we have some of the coalition members joining us here today, and I would like them to uh, just briefly, um, you know, introduce themselves, although some of you may have met them in, in earlier sessions, uh, and just tell us a little bit about um, their organization. Uh, and then uh, we'll be mo moving through some questions um, in particular about the coalition. Um, Mark, Graham, I know you've met a number of folks already through presentations at this uh, event, but if you could just briefly um, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about uh, your organization, and um, we'd love to hear that. Sure, great. Thank you uh, very much, Heather and, and, and Dan. Uh, yeah, my name is Mark Graham. I, I manage the Wayback Machine at the Internet Archive. Mark? Uh, yes? I can hear you. Great. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> this is our 25th uh, anniversary year, and uh, so we're really happy to be uh, celebrating that. Uh, we're a, a nonprofit uh, library uh, whose mission is universal access to all knowledge. Uh, we, we do our work in a number of ways. We take analog material, we digitize it, we preserve it and make it available, and we also collect digital information. We preserve it and make it uh, available. Uh, for us, it's all about what we call bits in and bits out. We bring in a lot of material and we, we push out a lot of material in a number of different formats, specifically um, books. We've, uh, we have digitized more than four million books. 
uh, uh, academic papers with scholar.archive.org. We've we've archived more than 28 million um, open access uh, journal uh, articles, television news. We've been digitizing uh, dozens of television news channels 24-7 for the last uh, better part of 10 years. Uh, the uh, government documents, uh, millions and millions of, of them. I'll talk a little bit about what we did with the Mueller re report, I think, further on. Music, including, for example, more than a quarter of a million 78s uh, that, that we've digitized and have made available on the web and via uh, voice services like Alexa and Google, et cetera, magazines, uh, and across the web. Uh, today, we archive more than a billion URLs a day, uh, and that's about 20,000 a second. Uh, and then th those are uh, accessed at, at the rate of about 5,000 uh, a second. I, we work really hard to make our services available to as many people as possible um, and uh, in through especially through integrations with platforms like Wikipedia um, and, and including integrations with browsers like Brave Browser, for example, and, uh, and, and browser extensions. So I'm super excited about uh, what's going on here with Slack because, we're, you know, we're, we're, but the bottom line is we, everything that we can do to accelerate and improve and enhance uh, issues that people have around uh, d uh, content discovery, access, use, and, and then most importantly, um, an understanding of context, uh, which often happens within a sharing environment, uh, is critically important to, to learning and, and engaging in, in our society. Uh, I have some other comments about that, but I'll stop, I'll stop there. There we go, he Heather, I've, I finished. Nathaniel. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Um, I'm Nathaniel Lee, corporate strategist at EBSCO Information Services. EBSCO is the leading provider of scholarly research and educational content to libraries. And so a large focus of, uh, uh, for us is um, helping that information be consumed in the most effective ways. Um, we think a lot about um, how do we identify future sources of growth and how do we make um, our products work better for our customers. Uh, our mission statement is to transform lives by providing reliable, relevant information when, how, and where people need it. And so with something like Slack, we think a lot about um, what is integration with the right content uh, tools and the right delivery mechanisms look like, because um, it's one thing to have um, the resources available. It's a, another thing entirely to consume them in the right context. Um, and I'm standing in, by the way, for my co counterpart from PM, Donna Shaw. If you uh, go to the video site, you'll um, see a lovely video uh, that, that she um, recorded on behalf of EBSCO. Um, she's uh, EBSCO's representative um, with Slack, um, really focusing on making sure that uh, the way that we talk about interoperability and standards around LTI and things like that, um, that we're really aligned to internal development. So happy to be here. Nathaniel, thanks. Delmar. <clears throat> um, so my name is Delmar Larson. Uh, I'm a professor of chemistry at UC Davis. Uh, I'm the founder and director of the Libertex Project. Uh, and the Libertex Project is run uh, as a not-for-profit organization. At least one leg is, and the other leg is as uh, a project uh, out of UC Davis. And the goal of the project is m meant in order to be able to disseminate uh, OER, Open Educational Resource uh, Content, uh, to academia um, and outside of academia, to anyone who's interested in, in reading and utilizing it. Uh, the the shtick of our project is to try to build a centralized infrastructure that can be curated uh, and openly edited, uh, and then uh, correspondingly uh, customized for individual um, faculty or individual campus use. Uh, a key aspect, obviously, in consuming textbooks, whether it's traditional or it's current, uh, let me phrase that, modern or the future, uh, is the ability in order to interact with it. In the past, that used to be by writing in your book, and oftentimes our books are quite written into, or at least my books are. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, in the, the modern age, that involves uh, uh, annotation infrastructure <laughs> like hypothesis. Uh, so the ability in order to uh, couple hypothesis uh, infrastructure in order to allow students in order to engage in these active uh, uh, activities uh, using our content is exceedingly of interest. Um, and we've been um, working with Hypothesis in uh, several projects, uh, primarily authentication and other mechanisms of using it uh, to constructively uh, empower uh, the usage of the LibreText project. So I'm happy to be here. 
So uh, I wanted to talk um, a little bit about the importance of broad scale initiatives like this. When Dan reached out to me initially um, to, to, to get involved in the project, he said, it's kind of along the lines of the Annotating All Knowledge Coalition. It's gonna to bring together folks to have those conversations uh, that might not ordinarily happen. So um, I'd love to hear uh, feedback for those of you who recently joined um, on, on the value that you see uh, in, in kind of putting these collaborative forums together. Mark, do you wanna start? Oh gosh, I don't know. So much has been said about this. And I just wanna underscore the videos that, that Dan painstakingly um, uh, got from, from various of us. And I, I listened to all of them last night, watched all of them last night, and I, I learned a lot. So I'm gonna put a plug in there uh, to, to amplify what, what has been, been said by so many of the other members of the, the coalition. Uh, to me, I, I'm, I'm here because representing the Internet Archive and there are many other uh, engineers and, and people at, at the Internet Archive that uh, I'll be working to liaison with and, and bring the conversation back to. But frankly, more than anything else is to, is to learn um, and, and be inspired um, and, uh, and, and understand opportunities that might exist out there that we can participate in to help integrate the services, specifically the services of, of the Internet Archive uh, into the larger learning in, in environment. But, you know, also I think this whole question of learning um, and social learning, I think social learning is like social distancing. I, I don't understand why we use the word social with distancing. It's just distancing. It's physical distancing, actually. And, and social learning, I, can't, I get that, like learning together. But there's also the concept like lifelong learning or just, you know, uh, uh, just in time learning. And, and I, you know, I think there was a conversation about um, like in, in the classroom or academia and in an other context. And I was just reflecting that with regard to learning um, these days for the last you know, year and a half, the, the learning for many of us has been up in the context of COVID. Right. So the question is like, you know, learning about issues important to our health and and in fact, our lives and, and the lives of our of our countries. Right. Uh, the, the health lives, academic uh, uh, and uh, and business, et cetera, all of it. And so where, where are we doing that learning? We're not doing that learning in the classroom. We're not doing that learning based upon much of what we had learned in the classroom. Historically, we're doing that learning on on social media. And uh, by and large, we're, we're doing it on Twitter and on Facebook and on TikTok and on news sites, uh, many of which aren't even actually news sites in the traditional way. They're, you know, they're sites that have a particular point of view sponsored by an organization that you might not even be aware of. So I think context is critically important in these times. And part of the context can come through the, the social aspects of, of what we're talking about here. So um, I don't know, that's kind of a long-winded way of saying, uh, I'm here to try to help learn about ways the, the Internet Archive as, as a resource, as a library, can be more useful to, to people uh, overall. And I'll just give one specific example. For example, when if someone is on a Wikipedia article, uh, they're reading a Wikipedia article and they want to go further, um, we're working to help ensure that anytime there is a reference to some external resource via a, 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 a website or a book or an academic paper or some other uh, resource, that that resource is available in a digital format um, and it's, it's, it's accessible via a click. And, and it's reliably accessible um, such that if something happens um, on the original source, then there's a backup of it. Um, and, uh, and, and in addition to that, to go further and to say what additional resources could be made available to uh, the, the person who's, who's on the Wikipedia article uh, to help them go further in their exploration. So that's just a, a very practical example of where we're trying to take some of the resources that are available from the Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine and extend them out um, into the larger um, information ecosphere. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, Nathaniel, I know EBSCO are huge uh, proponents of collaborations with, with libraries, but if, if you could tell us a little bit about, um, again, the importance of collaboration for EBSCO and maybe um, you know one particular idea that you think might uh, potentially uh, come from this collaboration. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think I'll start with the kind of where EBSCO is today. Um, 
we see our strength um well a, a large part of it just being a a content provider. We have partnerships with over 16,000 publishers and we're in ten, tens of thousands of libraries. And so we, um, anytime you have that type of um, positioning, you have to, um, I think, um, think critically about making that content as accessible as possible. And so when we, you know, in, in, in logistics, also in software, you know, think about what is the, the quote final mile of delivery, right? It's It's not just, you know, you, you, if you if you really want to find it, you can go and, and authenticate and, and get to that resource in the way that um, is is there. But also, when you're searching at your point of need or when it's being assigned in the LMS, are students able to actually access it at their convenience and and faculty able to uh, pass it along? And so historically, we've integrated with um, standards. Um, um, LTI is a good example of that, and we've had products that support that um, in in direct and indirect ways. But we see this as increasingly important. And I think I would just um, point at this post by uh, A16Z, the, the venture capital firm with Andreessen Horowitz, um, the person who first popularized software is first eating the world. And there's this great guest post right now that's talking about the resurgence of social, right? So everyone thought social was dead after Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, you know, afterwards, it, you know, it, it, it it's done with, but we're kind of entering a, 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 a social 2.0 wave. Um, you have platforms like Clubhouse and Spotify Green Room, which were just launched this week. Um, Facebook Audio Rooms, which are all about um, essentially helping people to engage in new ways um, virtually, but you know, a different medium. Now, instead of text or post, we're talking about audio. And I think that in traditional fields like classroom teaching and even research, um, like Mark said, um, it, it, social is almost like an unnecessary word there because they've always been social. It, it just so happens that now the technology is following suit. Thanks so much. And um, and, and moving over to you, Delmar, the open educational resources as a concept is fantastic. And, and, and really the idea of collaboration and sharing uh, just down into the into the the DNA there. So maybe um, I could ask you this the same question that Mark and, and Nathaniel um, answered. Just what um, is sort of the impetus for your participation, and and perhaps one thing that you think you might work on as a result. Well, <clears throat> so the the key aspect of OER, as many people probably know, the, the O in OER is open, which uh, obviously. Uh, is meant for freely distribution of, of content. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is not necessarily distribute content because there's a variety of mechanisms in order to go about doing that. We're trying to centralize it and provide a mechanism to curate the content and to customize the content for individual faculty at individual campuses. Uh, and the key aspect in terms of doing that is to realize, um, and it's not really much of a realization, um, that the, the concept of a class uh, is intrinsically a social aspect. Um, so uh, the ability in order to interact with your faculty or with your professor or instructor of record is critical, but also the ability to interact with your uh, peers um, in studying, grading, and doing sort of things. And that hasn't changed significantly when we've switched to uh, online activities. In fact, uh, it's that social aspect that's uh, in part uh, been uh, diminished uh, or at least uh, had mm -hmm. significant limitations by moving online. Uh, <clears throat> what we've been, uh, by trying to capitalize on how uh, we have traditionally been interacting in classrooms is how we want and interacting with textbook is how we actually want to be able to ensure the social aspect is coupled into the textbooks that are hosted on our, our project. Uh, and that in, entails uh, several different use cases that we try to push. And on, I mentioned the ability in order to edit the content of, of the uh, side of the pages, which is, you know, intrinsic to just the ability to um, just the base annotation capabilities, uh, but the ability in order to generate um, uh, effective learning circles or effective um, um, either uh, class participation or sub uh, group participation uh, is quite critical in terms of being able to maximize the learning experience and the utilization of the textbook to catalyze that is exceedingly important. Uh, and what we're trying to get off of this thing is to establish the best practices that can be implemented into our, uh, our infrastructure uh, with a shared authentication so that people can come in, faculty can realize how they can actually utilize these tools effectively in order to be able to extend what is traditionally done in the classroom uh, or 
via computers nowadays uh, or via screens uh, in order to be able to really maximize the educational experience. And there's a variety of different workflows that we have there. We want to be able to establish the best practices for doing that and then being able to utilize that scale for the, uh, the users that we have. Um, there was a second part of that question, which I've completely forgotten. Uh, so um, I think you touched on it a little bit, some of the things that okay. you might like to do. Um, is there more that you want to add on that front? Well, I mean, the social aspect is a, uh, particularly important. One of the aspects, well, obviously, but one of the key aspects that we've been trying to address is a, a central authentication infrastructure to facilitate that when a student comes in, irrespective of where they happen to come uh, from, that they have the ability in order to capitalize on these tools uh, as quickly as possible. Um, uh, <clears throat> and again, not necessarily uh, within all this hierarchical approach that I talked about. Um, and that's a key aspect that we've been uh, working on. The other aspect that we've been particularly interested in is being able to extend the concept of annotation to not just be uh, the ability to write pages down, whether they happen to be for the class or for faculty for providing information uh, off of that, uh, or even for reviewers in order to help facilitate the curation, but the ability in order to embed uh, different types of concepts uh, or different types of form factors of information. Um, for example, the ability to insert questions uh, into the side uh, or let me phrase that, uh, interactive questions that uh, can act as homework uh, in order to facilitate the next level of uh, interoperability or interactivity between the students and the, the content um, and other sorts of materials that I think is the, the next stage of annotation capabilities. So we're very excited about that. Great, thanks so much. And Dan, um, you know, you talked a little bit about why it was so important to create this this coalition in the first place. But I'd I'd love to hear, you know, your take on why um, Hypothesis is so committed uh, to collaborative organizations, whether it's from the W three C standard um, on through other industry groups, and and maybe some of the things that you're thinking about in relation to partners who are not able to join us. Um, thanks. Um... Yeah, I think the collaborative nature, I mean, there's two, two big reasons to, to work in groups like this um, and why, and specifically why you know, we put a bunch of energy to try to help bring people together. Number one, um, the, you know, there's, there's a work to be done to help bring this kind of interoperability and, and um, you know, kind of overall kind of ecosystem improvements that work, the more that we can be informed by the needs of the different parties in the ecosystem, um, uh, the better. The second reason though, is there's definitely an importance in signaling um, in that, um, like for instance, I'll give just give you an example of one, one capability um, that, um, um, is, you know, something we, we're very focused on. Right now, in order to launch, for instance, hypothesis over uh, a reading assignment in the LMS, you've got to go in as a teacher and, and, and say that you want to add this hypothesis module to this reading. So only in teachers that want to invite it into the classroom, and only when they decide that they want annotation as part of the module, are, is that is that fundamental capability going to be there on that reading? Um, really, what needs to happen is that administrators at, in, at universities need to be able to flick it on for every student to be able to use in any class on any reading as just a basic default um, um, capability that's present everywhere. Um, in, and and when st all the students when students realize. Now, maybe an instructor can go and turn it off specifically if they don't want, you know, the, the, you know, for this particular assignment or generally for their class to have that capability and, and they, they, you know, that's an anti-pattern for them. Great. But, in, you know, for the teacher who hasn't heard of it yet or doesn't care or whatever, where the students can still go into the document together and work together to help each other, um, that's, that's amazing. And the more present that it it is and the more places um, um, you know the, the more beneficial in order to get you know these LMS organizations that would need to be implementing this kind of capability in this much broader way in order to get attention 
in their product backlogs and prioritize things, it's super important to have, um, you know, a, a group of people that they rep recognize as their peers, um, they're saying that this is important to them. And so for us, the biggest value, one of the biggest values in bringing this together is to um, let people know that it's a priority for you know, some of the biggest you know, content um, platforms and so forth in the space. Thanks, that's very helpful. Um, it was interesting to me to go through the discussion process with a lot of the the partners, um, you know, who are, who are now in place, and um, we all know from COVID the importance of being able to access a variety of um, of digital learning materials, um, and and that's something that was was evident, you know, much earlier uh, for for those who are instructors and and, and students in the space. But perhaps you could, um, in in back to you, Dan, just talk about some of the challenges um, when uh, Hypothesis started to uh, integrate more closely, you know, with the LMS, uh, some of these walled gardens or proprietary uh, challenges that, that that raised their head that ultimately led to where we are here today. Um, well, just I'll mention two sm um, simple things. Um, and I, I, for me, it's not I don't think of these as walled gardens. I mean, we all know that there are walled gardens out there, but this is not a walled garden problem. This is this is really just a a problem with the web being a very uneven place with lots of different technologies that's implemented in some in some places one way and in another place another another way. Like for instance, some screen reader or page readers, book readers, um, the you know you can't select text. Um, and uh, you know that's a fundamental, you know, kind of a capability, super important for annotation. Uh, and so, if um, we're going to have broad annotation or other <coughs> kinds of social learning capabilities that can lay across content platforms that rely on some of these fundamentals, then I think it's important to highlight those. What are the things that are important about the way content is represented? Um, you know, that are necessary for um, for you know, these kinds of um, third party, you know, or, or interoperable experiences. Um, so the second thing is um, in terms of passing authentication around uh, and sharing authentication, there's a lot that's built into LTI, but there's a lot that's not quite specified yet and which needs, um, which isn't even related to necessarily to the LTI standard that has to do with how these things can get passed or inherited back, you know, between kind of tools and platforms and so forth. Um, and in, in a way, this is kind of taking some of the work, like for instance, <clears throat> in 1.3, and really digging into the use cases for it and more fully expressing those um, and doing that together with a, a broad selection of different platform providers. Thanks. Um, Nathaniel, I know that EBSCO is um, very much focused on uh, student outcomes and, and making sure that those those outcomes are successful. Um, from the from the your perspective um, in uh, talking with different EBSCO partners and in, incorporating uh, different things either into the discovery service or into to EBSCO host, um, could you talk about the value around you know interoperability and standards in that regard? I know you sure. mentioned that. Why, yeah. but maybe did we go a little bit deeper for it? Well, I, I, I guess I would say there's three large outcomes that I can, maybe four, um, to break the consulting rule. Um, help faculty more easily assign materials. Um, help students um, uh, actually um, get more of the supplemental content delivered at the point of need. And I think part of that speaks to the affordability issue. Um, when you think about um, how do you students use um, our content today, um, a lot of it's for uh, outside of the um, a, a scholarly research context. Um, you you have the um, um, it's really about writing papers. It's really about you know finding the, the quality authority, authoritative research, um, and and a lot of that is supplemental in, in the educational context. And so um, our resources might be used alongside um, OER type resources like like LibreText and 
And so in that type of context, what we want to do is make that um, information be more easily pulled uh, when faculty members are thinking about how can they, you know, affordably um, run out their curriculum content. So that's that's one of those use cases. Uh, another use case um, is just um, the library uh, themselves. Um, that's a, a large focus for us as a company. Um, we spend a lot of our time uh, uh, really supporting the needs of, of uh, librarians, whether they be academic or, um, in this case as well, um, K through 12. And um, a lot of our library customers are focused on curriculum development and, and helping support the faculty um, and, and student needs around that. And so those are kind of like the high level outcomes. Um, in terms of the actual kind of day one, um, you know, what is that going to entail? I think we're very much, uh, watching to see how this is going to evolve and um, kind of be different than something like um, at, um, what a lot of the LTI standards work and what IMS Global has done. I think one of the reasons we were really excited about um, joining this um, this early on was because of the leadership with Dan and Heather and their work around W3C standards. Um, we think that um, even if it's um, even if there are early stage um, opportunities in the market and there's a couple different directions that can go, if you have strong leadership, then there's um, a, a lot that you can do. Thanks so much. And um, so Delmar, just uh, as a, an, an OER um, uh, company, uh, I would imagine there's a lot of um, startups in the tool space that that are kind of reaching out to you guys um, about you know potential integrations uh, and the like. Um, one of the I think potential benefits for uh, a coalition like this um, would be having more interoperability would make it easier for outside tool creators uh, to to participate in the space. Could you talk a little bit about um, you know how how LibreText has has found that uh, process to be uh, in the past and maybe what you look forward to perhaps shifting in that regard? Um, <clears throat> let me answer that and maybe answer my version of that question uh, in, in order to get that across. The the and, and this probably applies to all of academia or, or all of uh, ed tech, <laughs> but certainly in the OER community, I think it's somewhat of a uh, wild, wild west, although things are getting a little bit better in terms of standards, because there's really no standards uh, uh, out there uh, in terms of how we store things, how we transfer things, uh, and even the, the uh, or at least some standards that do exist uh, are oftentimes very uh, um, not 100% reliable in order to be able to do stuff. For example, we have OER content stored in a variety of different formats. Uh, we have stuff as LaTeX. We have stuff as uh, uh, text uh, files. We have websites. We have various packages uh, that you can store content and distribute. Uh, and, and it's a very hodgepodge of different things. And currently, there is no single uh, standard across the whole plat whole OER infrastructure for content to be distributed in one, con one region or the other. That's one of the reasons why a significant part of our effort uh, is what I refer to as harvesting, which is involving uh, somewhere on the order of 100 undergraduate students at UC Davis. They're largely plowing through and manually integrating content into our platform. Now, it's not that we're necessarily establishing a, a standard per se, although <clears throat> uh, we are by bringing everything into our platform and, and it's centrally standardized and sta in the uh, underlying code and, and how we store it. Um, so there's the, the point of that is that there's uh, quite a lot of need for interoperability uh, in establishing the source standards that slack is uh, is implementing in the oer uh, infrastructure <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, obviously multiple platforms have started to uh, in the oer landscape have started to grow up especially many of them that are for profit that have identified uh, a niche of somehow still being oer but still trying to make a uh, uh, make profit off of the, the, the whole situation, which is quite an interesting balancing act that they're able to do. But as these new projects uh, are formed and start to grow, uh, the need for interoperability uh, is certainly very critical in order to be able to implement that. And that's what I'm hoping that Slack is able to, uh, to pursue and uh, establish, at least within the annotation sphere. Thanks. I remember one of the very first workshops um, I participated in when I joined Hypothesis was an OER workshop, and just the the multiple layers that uh, annotation could bring to um, a 
completely reusable and remixable resource like OERs. Um, you can have the students uh, learning collaboratively from each other. You can have the instructors uh, working together with the students, because you can also have the network of instructors who are using the resource, use it as a back channel to share tips and best practices, uh, and even have the, um, the authors and the creators of the project uh, making their own internal annotations, you know, for future editions. So it was kind of mind blowing to hear, um, you know, kind of all of those, those, you know, facets uh, for, for annotation across, across OER. Um, Mark, you sort of um, uh, kind of touch a lot of different parts of the, the industry. <clears throat> You know, given your role there at the Internet Archive and and, and with the Wayback Machine, um, and and I'm just wondering, you know, we've talked about the the folks who are participating in Slack, you know, thus far. If if you have thoughts on, you know, how the initiative might even ultimately, you know, be broadened, what other voices might be beneficial to have in the conversation moving forward? Yeah, uh, m most certainly, and I'm you know. I, I have ideas about specific organizations and individuals and initiatives, et cetera. I won't go into them right, right, right now. But, but I do want to make some other comments. I mean, I, I actually do want to call out um, uh, some challenges here. The, the world is not moving in, in, in the right direction in a lot of ways um, uh, around, I think, some of the values that, that Dan and others have been promoting and that certainly Brewster Kale at the Internet Archive and others in this world of open. Um, you know, so let's be specific. Uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, Amazon uh, owns the bulk of the market in eBooks and the Kindle platform, uh, either on their hardware or uh, the way I read my, all of my books are inside the Kindle software on an iPad, uh, is a closed environment by and large. Uh, the, uh, news, uh, more and more, uh, is is pe people are consuming through apps on their uh, Android and iOS devices. And, and those apps, the, the Apple News app, which I think uh, President Biden said he gets most of his news from the Apple News platform, um, it's a closed environment. Um, if I want to annotate, uh, I can't necessarily even annotate for a variety of technical reasons. The, the, uh, for, forget access to the information. It may be even encrypted. Um, on the, the device. So being able to uh, annotate a book, for example, and then share that. Um, I can do it to some degree within that closed environment, right? So, you know, Apple and Amazon and others have done a pretty decent job of, of serving uh, their constituencies within their environments, but not across environments. So I think we need to like, just call that for what it is. And, it, and it's not a healthy um, uh, you know, movement for an, an open uh, uh, a learning and social and collaborative ecosystem. Uh, the flip side of it is that there are uh, examples and opportunities where uh, things are open and connected and, and accessible. I, I just, uh, just this morning, and we get a, a comments from donors uh, at the Internet Archive, and this one just came in this morning. They said, after I read the New York Times obituary for Leonard, uh, for Chief Leonard Crowdog, spiritual le leader at Wounded Knee, and learned he released an album of ceremonial songs in 1972, I began a frustrating and futile search online. Um, well, the flip, the, the the rest of the story is that we had archived, we had digitized, um, and and made available that recording uh, from 1972, and it's available from the Internet Archive. But you know, the the person had to come to us and search in our system for some reason it wasn't uh, well indexed uh, on Google. But wouldn't have been, wouldn't it be nice if someone had taken and annotated the New York Times article? Um, with a, with a, you know further reading, additional links. So in a collaborative way, we could have built on each other's works. Um, so stitching together in an in, in overlay of the web and, and other related resources uh, to, um, to to connect together the you know different platforms and services and information resources over time. I think that's the the vision and opportunity that that Dan and others here in the coalition are pursuing. I just also add the the bit I you know I, I, I spoke a fair amount um, about um, Wikipedia. And, and work that we're doing to connect, I think, Wikipedia and Wikipedians uh, are, are a you know, natural ally uh, in this effort. Uh, government documents, you know, the, I, I've, I've spoken about this um, at length, but very briefly, when the Mueller report was released, there were more than 2,000 footnotes in it. Only seven of them were clickable. 
Uh, and uh, and so, you know, we work with Digital Public Library of America and others, and we did primary research and we found more than 700 of the reference documents. Uh, and we added links to them both with as a within the EPUB, we published an EPUB. We also used a, a modified version of the Hypothesis client with a modified version of PDF.js to make an open, accessible, annotated version of the Mueller report. Now, you, you might think, okay, that's interesting and useful and it's there, but it's actually a lot harder than that because there's one particular document referenced in the Mueller report that I think has gone through five different revisions or uh, you know declassification review processes since it was first published. So this is an, an, a, a living process of, of knowledge discovery uh, and an opportunity to make that more accessible to people who want a more context for what it is they're paying attention to. Uh, I, I could go on, but uh, I think suffice to say that there is, um, this is a, a, you know, a big open field and I'm happy to be uh, in it with the people here and, and many other people around the world, you know, and not just English and not just you know, uh, North America, but this is really a, a global opportunity and need, especially in the context of the splinter net that we that we experience, whether it be a splinter net um, divided up through technology uh, and limited access. And uh, there's been reports this last week, for example, especially uh, with regard to China and some of the early research about COVID that has uh, already been disappeared off of, of, of platforms at scale. There's a major article about that in the LA Times yesterday, uh, but also um, language and, and culture and other kind of barriers that, that separate us uh, from each other and, and conversations of shared, shared interests. Oh, and by the way, Splinternet is the name of a book. If you wanna read more about the Splinternet, that there's a book by that, that, that title. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Uh, I love SplinterNet. I remember when I first started annotating and I was a little bit um, hesitant to do public annotations. One of the things I'd do is I'd pick an interesting article about spiders or about a museum and I would go through and add um, links to related resources. So it can be um, a really worthwhile activity and it would be great. Um, let's get together like an annotate-a-thon and like, let's all do, let's all do that. Um, I want to talk about accessibility because, Dan, you had that in your initial slides on the coalition, and that was something that came up in a lot of conversations um, with potential partners. If um, folks have watched the videos, um, you know, you'll see uh, George Kirscher is very um, active with Benetech and Daisy, um, you know, talking about some of the things that um, can be done uh, for the visually impaired. Um, we have a video that will be coming shortly um, with uh, Professor Raja Kushnagar at, uh, at Gallaudet University um, uh, talking about um, uh, how they might be able to utilize uh, uh, social learning uh, on, on campus and beyond there. But, but, but Dan, um, you know, it's not always uh, the easiest thing for folks to wrap their brains around. So could you talk a little bit about accessibility and, and how that comes into play? Yeah, um, um, accessibility is super important. You know, I won't go too much into that except to say um, it's not only in a lot of places um, mandated and regulated, um, you know, as part of, uh, you know, the learning experience increasingly, but it's just good practice um, to um, make things as accessible to as many people as possible. And, um, you know, I think the field first kind of got started around um, needs of the disabled, but really the larger paradigm is, is just about making things easier to use um, in more, more ways for more people more of the time. Um, and there's some already when you bring a hypothesis to a document, for instance, just from our perspective, um, you introduce more complexity and more navigational um, considerations um, and you know, things like screen readers having to interact with both the content and then the interaction that's going on um, and how, um, for instance, highlight, how highlights are inserted into the text of the page um, and kind of how to use that in a, in a, in a way that fits with, within um, screen reader software is, is, a, is a particular challenge and it needs to be addressed as part of um, you know, an overall effort to, to try to solve this problem at, at a larger scale. 
Thanks. And, um, you know, Delmar, the open educational resources are, are frequently created um, directly by faculty in the field, um, sometimes on short term grants from their institution or their library or, 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 or beyond. Um, but they require a lot of uh, effort uh, to initially create and, and to maintain. Are there unique accessibility challenges um, around uh, that type of content? Have, are there best practices that you can point people to around accessibility? <clears throat> uh, well, there are certainly significant issues associated with this uh, uh, massive parallelized effort in generating OER across a variety of sources. And, and the issues behind it uh, from an accessibility perspective is that accessibility, uh, it, uh, while Almost everyone, and I would like to believe everyone, uh, wants to make their resources fully accessible to the greatest possibility uh, possible. Uh, the uh, the rules uh, and the mechanisms in order to do that are oftentimes quite difficult for the average faculty member mm -hmm. to be able to master. Um, so you have a faculty member that is a subject matter expert in a specific field, uh, and they spend their effort focusing on writing that content. Uh, and the only best way I can see this thing operating at scale is to have a specific team dedicated in order to be able to then take what was constructed in the OER and then move it forward uh, in the accessibility perspective. In our case, we have a, a several accessibility people people, uh, external experts. We have a, a gaggle of students that just go through and digest uh, and update things. And right now they're actually going through a variety of different uh, of our technologies in order to help uh, update the VPAT that we have. Um, but um, uh, that team also uses uh, hypothesis uh, as a mechanism in order to identify various components that they want to be able to update. And that's part of the general curation uh, workflow that we have in order to facilitate reading because it's the most effective way in order to be able to identify issues and, and, and to update them um, uh, and such. So uh, that perspective is exceedingly important from uh, the importance of curating the content um, so that you're not just providing uh, an overlay of content content or an overlay of, uh, of comments to be able to take those comments and make them actionable in order to be able to go back to the original content and update them so they're actually then addressed. Uh, and that's a key component of, uh, of making curatable living libraries and not a, a repository of what I refer to as dead libraries um, or zombie-like libraries or somewhere in the, in the middle uh, where things are sometimes editable and sometimes not. For example, a pile of PDFs uh, is probably one of the worst uh, um, repositories in order to be able to do that, irrespective of the ability in order to provide an important annotations on top of it, you're unable to uh, to update that. So it's a key aspect that um, that we have to deal with in the OER uh, uh, ecosystem, but also that uh, hypothesis and social annotation that helps to facilitate us addressing them. Thank you, um, Nathaniel. I know, of course, um, given the variety of institutions that 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 EBSCO is is working with globally, that that accessibility, um, you know, must be key. But I wonder, in addition to accessibility, which is already a big topic, um, more and more we speak about, you know, inclusivity and and, and equity. Um, you know, if you could talk just a little bit about how that uh, comes into play at EBSCO as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean. I was actually going to build off what Delmar said first, just about the accessibility piece, um, because it, it um, just in terms of getting access to the to the article itself and, and the whole comment about PDF, um, we were definitely seeing that pain point and that issue um, when you just kind of extract the PDF and then you and you go dump it and and you try to do all this interaction around it. Yes, you can you can have a certain layer level of functionality, but it's different than actually being able to. Um, um, interact with like content and and pull it and 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 actually have it be able to um, uh, be modified um, when there are changes down the line and so that's one of the reasons why we we did the effort around um, the LTI and and the um, sorry I'm, I'm blanking the name of the product uh, faculty um, select and curriculum builder are a couple of our products in this space because um, we were finding that faculty members were just kind of downloading PDFs and, and trying to re-upload them elsewhere to, to do functionality. Um, you know, on the equi equity piece, that that's um, obviously a harder challenge and, and as a content company, um, one that we have to uh, face um, in a lot of ways. I saw a comment in the chat about um, publishing in general and um, I, I think one of the unique challenges that EBSCO faces as an aggregator is that we have to think about um, 
are we curating from the right places? Are we indexing the right literature? Are we, you know, Western focused, or are we um, able to get a, a global enough um, perspective? Um, it it is something that um, we work through a lot. Um, I, I think I will say, you know, that um, at a high level. Um, The way that um, our, our products are, are set up, we we have um, we have different teams that are um, constantly looking at, at how to um, improve just not just the um, the content um, but also the software pieces. Um, I just I just realized I uh, I've been talking for a long time. Um, I, I I guess from an accessibility standpoint, um, I would say that. Um, I'm, I'm less close to um, a lot of the technical work that we're doing, but one of the things that I do know is that um, our product managers try to ground in, in the practice of, um, uh, of of how other institutions are actually implementing it well. And so one of the things that we did is we partnered with the Carroll Center for the Blind um, in Massachusetts to try to better understand, um, at least from a UI standpoint, how do users actually interact with the products. Um, there, there's actually um, some really helpful resources out there um, that just speak to um, when you approach the product development lifecycle and, 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 and all of that, um, there's a lot of assumptions that you bring into it just looking at the software, but you wouldn't realize that it's completely different if you're interacting with it in a different way. You have to like actually, you know, hold down the software and you have to build these different um, features in to be able to let um, visually impaired users um, uh, hear the, the prompts are getting back, change where items are displayed and all of that. And so um, I think for us as a software company, we focus a lot on kind of the um, the UI elements. From a content perspective, we also have teams that are looking at the uh, um, at the uh, uh, the kind of equity around um, content and and uh, curation for sure. There was just something else I like to throw in here because there's some conversation about cost and money and all the rest of that. Um, you know, I think to the degree that we can open up options. And um, and work against lock-in, then um, then that's going to be good for, for 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 people to be able to make choices where maybe they, they can't today. So I, I'm going to give you just an example. There's a platform um, by uh, Follett called Destiny, and it's 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 a popular platform in schools across um, um, America. A on their website, they say that they support uh, they in integrate with open standards like OER. I don't know what that means because OER is not a standard. And if you click on the link, it's actually a dead link. The, um, the it, but 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 more if you try to like uh, if you're a teacher and you want to uh, use a book, let's say the Diary of Van Frank in your classroom, the Diary of Van Frank uh, through the Follett uh, Destiny system costs twenty seven dollars per student per year to license. Okay, and um, and and there aren't other options within that platform for the teacher, or if there are, the teacher probably doesn't have time to figure out what what they are, etc. So I just think that in general terms, you know, opening up uh, opportunities for people to be able to be more uh, have more choice, more choice is 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 good. And there's one other comment about the environment that, we're, that we're, we're talking about. I spoke a little earlier about these closed gardens, uh, you know, the apples and the, the, the Amazons, et cetera. There's another dynamic going on, which is uh, uh, feeds in general. The, 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 the fact that most of the, most people are getting most of their information these days, not by going to some place and seeing something within a semi-static context, like say a Wikipedia article, they're getting it from, a stream of information that's flowing by from one of a number of, of services like TikTok or Twitter, et cetera. And there's some certain fundamental dynamics about that that I think are not really healthy from a information diet perspective. I mean, the one is that you just get a snapshot of whatever the stream is, it's going by, right? And you, it's almost random that you're gonna get what it is, or there's a, a, a hyper focus on the idea of new. The newest stuff is, is, is somehow more interesting or enticing than, than the stuff that maybe happened. And the other is, is uh, persistence. Uh, how do you address this that's, that's passing by? It, it's, it's inherently ephemeral. In, in a variety of ways, you, it, even from going back and say, oh, I saw that on Facebook, where the heck was that? I can't even find where, where it was. Um, and so I, I just think that, uh, that annotation, um, an ability to uh, quote something, 
uh, to compare and contrast. These are fundamental qualities of, of critical thinking. And so the degree that we can help make tools that can support critical thinking process by enabling the ability to persistently and reliably quote something and to be able to compare and contrast it uh, is, is, is useful. And, uh, and yet another reason why this uh, coalition is so critically important. Dan, I wanted to give you an opportunity to come in on the accessibility and uh, equity questions. Um, well, I mean, on, on accessibility, I think, um, you know, I, I kind of spoke to that, I think, before. Um, uh, I, I would provide one additional example, which is um, um, in trying to, um, you know, we, we went through the, this, this is a process called WCAG, which stands for Web Content Addressability Guidelines, which is kind of a standard for um, accessible, meeting accessibility. And, you know, and it's comp pretty complicated. And we actually brought in an outside consultant to go through the whole thing and, you know, make sure that we were, you know, meeting, you know, these um, guidelines in, in important ways. And, and they provided a whole mess of um, recommendations and we took them through engineering and the whole thing took like six months to go through and make sure that we were addressing every single thing required, you know, necessary to go meet these guidelines. And then we had um, George Kircher from Benetech call us a little bit later after that and go, you know, some of our folks are really having an issue. It turns out that um, that actually the screen readers um, were having a fundamental issue with using Hypothesis. And the big surprise to me was that the screen reader um, interoperability wasn't necessarily one of the checkboxes that we need to, you know, to meet for WCAG 2.1. And, and actually the problem turned out to be bigger than like a hypothesis thing that, um, um, that when in, um, on, in Microsoft Windows, in, when you select text inside of a screen reader like JAWS or NVDA, that the selection is cap is held secret in a private buffer inside that application and isn't even available to the browser itself. And so from hypothesis perspective, you couldn't, when you want to go to annotate, that text isn't even you know, kind of there to work with. So that's a really fundamental problem um, that um, we reached out to NVDA. They're um, willing to actually modify the way NVDA works and extend it to be able to support this use case, which is great, and scheduled that work for August. Um, so that's just an example, and, and now we're trying to reach out to the right people at JAWS um, to do the same same kind of work. This is just an example of, of how I think working together, um, we can help solve some of these um, problems that are kind of lo larger problems than any one single um, um, you know, vendor or participant or whatever. Great, it's wonderful, Dan, that um, through the process with Hypothesis, um, those kinds of challenges were, were able to come uh, t to light. Um, I think, you know, all of us benefit from affordances that may have been initially put into a place for, for one particular reason, but then there's all sorts of uh, other scenarios where, where they can be uh, tremendously helpful. Um, I do want to just um, loop back a bit uh, to talk, uh, you know, Mark said he had a bunch of ideas of some other folks that, you know, we might want to consider inviting, you know, to the coalition, and I'm sure that, uh, that Delmar and, and Nathaniel do as well. Um, so uh, maybe, uh, Mark, you could kick us off with a couple folks uh, that you think would really bring a lot to this uh, coalition. So, oh, I mean, yeah, there's just the usual suspects that I would start start with, but I mean, Creative Commons, uh, Mozilla, Wikipedia. Is the, but here's the thing about Wikipedia, a lot of people don't realize, is this the Wikimedia Foundations, uh, principally the US and, and the German, but there's 321 Wikipedia sites, uh, different language editions, and those are really separate uh, communities uh, of and uh, they make their own decisions, set their own priorities. So. Yeah, just the, the open culture uh, world in, in general 
uh, is is certainly where I where I would put uh, focus. Uh, not not to say that the for profit world um, you know doesn't have a role and an impact, and certainly to the degree that we could in, reach out and and in, involve. The organizations that I was commenting on earlier, I mean, the, the Apples and the, the Amazons of the world, I think that that would be useful. Um, I was especially encouraged by, by David's presentation uh, at the, the earlier session today about the work that Google is, is doing. Uh, and so I didn't see their name on the list either. But, uh, but you know, it, this isn't about getting names on a list, right? This is about... Um, actually uh, coming up with some proposals and uh, making some reference implementations and inspiring and supporting uh, each other in the process. And so far, for me at least, uh, uh, with regard to the Internet Archive, this has already been a, a fruitful endeavor. Wonderful. Delmar? I don't think I can say anything that Mark didn't already say there quite beautifully. Um, the The opportunity of various people jumping on board is certainly uh, meaningful in order to move the thing forward. Um, <clears throat> uh, but they're always the, the usual suspects uh, uh, in, in order to ask uh, for. I, I would need to think a little bit more in terms of how to try to uh, perhaps make the, the, the infrastructure set up in order to, to get the smaller uh, enterprises uh, that collectively can scale up quite significantly, but uh, at an individual level is not quite uh, uh, easy in order to target. Um, and I'm not able to actually provide any clear examples off the top of my head in terms of uh, what fits into that category, but I'm sure there are many of them out there. That's uh, that's okay. That's what the ongoing conversations with the coalition are, are going to be for. Um, Nathaniel? Well, Mark put it so well, um, but if I had to say without naming names, because I could get in trouble here, the other content providers, um, you, you know, you have textbook um, providers and publishers, you have um, other content aggregators um, that in our industry, EBSCO is not the only one, we may be one of the largest, but there are um, others out there. Um, and then you have just traditional scholarly publishers as well, many of whom already partner with um, Hypothesis and EBSCO works with many of them as well. So I, I, I see that there is an opportunity. Um, EBSCO and oftentimes um, we, we participate in these types of initiatives and we really don't intend for it to be like, you know, we're doing it in, in lieu of our publisher partners, but rather um, in conjunction with hopefully could be the goal. Great, and I'm seeing some suggestions in the chat. And 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 Dan, um, we as, as Dan mentioned, there's a number of conversations that are uh, you know in process and ongoing. What you see in the sort of first uh, round uh, participants are the folks you know with uh, with vision. So we couldn't be more excited um, to have you guys participating. Um, and and there will be uh, some additional participants added um, you know in the coming weeks. So watch for uh, some videos mm -hmm. and and the like there. Um, Dan, do you want to talk just a little bit more maybe about some of the, the, the segments yeah. folks that we're going after? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I won't, you know, there's, there's tons of folks out there, but I will target one group in particular um, to with, with special attention, and that is the LMS um, platforms themselves. Um, you know, they really are in a, you know, not surprisingly central role with respect to the kind of switching mechanism of how student, you know, the, the classroom paradigm and pattern kind of works from clicking on a, stu uh, a you know, a, a lesson going through and, and, you know, kind of learning. Um, and there's a lot um, that they can do to really open up and enable a lot of the different kind of paradigm, different paradigms and so forth that we're talking about. So we're, super interested in, in, you know, kind of advancing those conversations and, and beginning to get them to the table, which they're interested. Um, and I think that's them seeing that there's real interest from their peers um, will help. Um, also, we've begun some conversations with folks at like Zoom and YouTube and so forth, um, but I would say non-traditional education providers. Um, but ones that can be extremely powerful in terms of, uh, you know, how if, you know, there's a larger set of, you know, kind of standards and patterns and practices here um, could participate, um, you know, very, um, very much and, um, you know, in, in these kind of, this kind of work. So really excited for that, um, um, for the, those conversations too. 
Great. So I think we um, we have we have a few more minutes. Um, so if you can squeak your question in, uh, if you get it in now. But um, if uh, I, I'd like to ask a question that was part of the video. So for folks who uh, like Mark and I who've watched all the videos, um, in my case, uh, numerous times, um, we we did close those interviews by uh, asking if there is uh, advice you'd give to folks who are who are considering whether or not they should join. Um, so maybe we can do just a quick. Uh, rapid fire round. Nathaniel, um, you didn't get to make uh, that video yourself. Um, you know, Donna made that and she did an amazing job. But um, what suggestion would you have for folks who, who, who may be on the fence or wondering if this initiative is right for them? Well, I, um, I think my advice is going to be more for the, the larger kind of um, corporate or even just larger organizational because um, I'll speak to how Donna and I were able to kind of um, help others see the vision as well. Um, I, I guess, like anything, it's it's about understanding: is this is this going to happen, and and how fast is this going to happen, and and does the world need to move in this way? And if so, um, are you um, kind of a central agent? Are you just um, part of it? And just trying to help understand um, where where does your organization sit, right? So if if you're a provider of content, um, in which uh, case, um, and and your primary use case is around teaching and learning, then it's really important that it gets accessed in the right ways. If you're a technology company, then it's really more about uh, are we going to get the right types of engagement with our users? Um, or if you are, you know, uh, you have a very strong nonprofit mission and you're trying to figure out how do we better engage with our community. I mean, this is a this is a very good way to um, uh, demonstrate that you're um, interested in and in, in, uh, making the move. Um, and so internally, it was just kind of showing the, the momentum that, that's been made on this initiative, outlining at a high level on what other standards like LTI, um, for, that's, I know we talked about that a lot, that this talk, but that's, that's just the one that keeps coming up over and over again. And just understanding LTI exists. Um, we integrate with LTI. Uh, many others integrate with LTI. Um, have a lengthy Q&A with Dan and Heather um, that, that went for a couple of weeks just about how is this going to be different than that? And, um, you know, sh sharing the results of that back with, um, you know, whoever your stakeholders are and just helping them understand that, you know, this is they're not trying to recreate the wheel here. They're trying to help build um, uh, uh, documentation and workflows that um, ideally would take LTI to, to another level. Thanks, and um, uh, Delmar, I want to give you an opportunity. Um, I think I may have mentioned uh, or uh, quoted Nike when I actually did it, it was just do it. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the downside is in terms of um, being in part of this the Slack other than being able to dedicate the time in order to be able to see the um, or to participate actively into it. Um, uh, other than that, uh, Nathaniel did a pretty beautiful job in terms of taking the different scopes of, uh, of individuals and, and why they want to be able to get involved into it. So, mm -hmm. Mark? Mark? Uh, I, I have nothing more to, to add to this that I <laughs> heard said. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just quote I'll just what you said. In, here, so. I'll quote what you said in the video that you wanted to turn the question around. And say why not participate? So, fantastic. Yeah, that that's a good way of looking at it. But you know, this conversation in the chat right now about who pays for this stuff. And I, I don't, I don't know. This is I'm not coming at this from a position of scarcity. There's a there's a lot of resources and money out there. This is about a, about alignment of our priorities as a society with regard to the technology that 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 we're building and the services that we're providing that we already spend literally trillions of dollars on worldwide ed education and specifically around, I want to pu put a plug in for the, uh, the OER community. My wife happens to run OER Commons, uh, which is a, a leading OER uh, aggregation uh, and distribution library service. And it's like, it's not, I don't think it's a matter of a lack of, of dollars. We're spending dollars um, at, 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 like never before on entertainment, um, and um, on, on education, but it's a matter of how we're prioritizing that that spend and and helping to ensure that we're we're maximizing the the, the human benefit uh, for this and uh, and and the, we 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 shift a, even a small amount of the dollars that are already being spent in, uh, spent in, into a thoughtful application of tech technology and services that um, that they can universally benefit humanity. 
you know, there was a, a comment earlier about how I maybe I had a U.S. centric view. May, I'm sure I do at a bias and I try to work against that. But, you know, UNESCO, for example, has a, has a program around OER that's very active. And uh, certain countries do as well, where countries have mandated that educational resources have to be um, have to be open and, and accessible. Uh, in many cases, the money is already being spent by by university, uh, either paid for through tuition or through uh, through taxes, etc. So I don't know. I don't. I think it's a matter of of choice about how we prioritize for outcomes, and less about a scarcity model of not enough money to get uh, to get these things done. Thanks, Mark. It's it's been a pleasure to hear from all of you, and I'll turn over to Dan for the for the last word to close us up. Um, I think Mark's finale was a great one to end on, and um, I just thanks for everybody for coming, and uh, we're ready to get started and get to work. <laughs>